Welcome back, America. We continue our conversation on nuclear energy with one of the most important voices in Congress, Congress when it comes to energy. Iowa Congresswoman Mary Nett Miller Meeks serves as the vice chair of the conservative climate cost. Yes, conservatives do have a solution for climate change in a, a lower carbon future. She also has been one of the uh, leading voices on reducing carbon emissions for years. Just last year, she took part in the 2022 United Nations Climate Change Conference in Egypt. And she talks about the impact of nuclear energy innovation with us right now. Joining us, Congresswoman Marinette Miller-Meeks. Congresswoman, great to have you on the show. It's great to be with you, John, and great to be with your audience. It's a great honor. You have really been a leader. And I want to knock down one of the false narratives in Washington, that somehow Republicans don't care about the environment. That's not true, right? We have Teddy Roosevelt. We've got Ronald Reagan, who did really epic things. Donald Trump, one of the largest conservation laws in history. Uh, but you've been really working on that clean energy plan, the alternative to the Green New Deal. Tell us how, why more Ameri what Americans need to know to understand just how serious Republicans are about this issue. Well, first and foremost, let me just say that all of us, all Republicans, as well as the rest of the nation, uh, we want a cleaner, healthier planet for our children and our grandchildren. So let's start with that, that we want a cleaner, healthier planet. But we also want to be able to compete economically around the globe. And so we want energy that is affordable, uh, low cost, that it's accessible, that it is abundant, that it is uh, clean, and that it is secure and reliable. So if we start with that principle, that vision that we want a cleaner, healthier planet, but we want to be able to compete economically around the globe, and we start with the caveats, then that opens up a wide array of energy platforms. So I'm agnostic as to the energy source, as long as it uh, can be cleaner and lower carbon emissions. And I think too often we get caught up in what type of energy and we miss that we're trying to lower carbon emissions. So how do we do that? Uh, and you mentioned one of those, and that's nuclear. In Iowa, we have over 50% of our energy is from renewables, over 50% of our electricity is from wind, and we're a net exporter of energy, which is astounding when you think about it in a small state. But we have biorenewables, uh, we have um, compressed renewable natural gas, ethanol, biodiesel, manure that goes into energy production, biomass that goes into energy production. Uh, we have wind and we have solar, and until recently, we also had a nuclear power. So we have all of those energy sources, and I like to break it down into liquid fuels, um, and then uh, you know the type of energy that you need to heat your home, uh, cool your home, uh, you know to keep you comfortable, and those various uh, you know quality of life um, instrumentals. So I think that we have a lot to that we can uh, we can provide and talk about. But Republicans, we uh, use innovation. We want to be pragmatic. We know that there are increased energy demands. And to your point, uh, even at the UN uh, climate uh, summits, uh, they have uh, everyone agrees that the demand for energy is going up. It is not going down. And energy efficiency alone is not going to be able to meet the rising demands of energy. So it has to be affordable, has to be a quality of life issue, has to be reliable, has to be abundant. Um, and then it has to be secure. Yeah, that's so important because energy security is national security, as you've reminded Absolutely. us often. Um, in some states there, that aren't blessed with wind like Iowa or sun like California, uh, finding a renewable energy source is a little bit trickier. And nuclear was really off the table for about a decade. People just wouldn't talk about it after the Japanese Fukushima reactor accident, of course, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, other ones. But in the last few uh, months, particularly, maybe the last couple of years, nuclear is really being reinserted into the conversation. Why is that? What's going on behind the scenes in policy circles that has put nuclear back on the table? Well, I think a couple of things. And so you mentioned that when you mentioned wind and solar. And so number one, we need to have the flexibility of energy source depending upon where you live. And so yes, there's uh, sun in California, there's wind in Iowa, there's wind in Texas, but there's hydropower in the Northwest. Uh, and in the, you know, in the uh, central United States as well. Uh, there is natural gas production, which as we know has zero emissions. Uh, so natural gas is certainly an alternative and has really replaced coal fired plants and reduced uh, uh, emissions dramatically uh, here in the United States. And so looking at what, what flexibility we have among states for what resources they have, why are we now seeing uh, nuclear come back into the forefront? And that's a, several things. One is continual base load or capacity. 
So uh, depending upon the energy source, if you don't have a uh, continual energy source, a utility com a company can't just you know, turn on and off the switch if you don't have sun generating electricity. And if you don't have wind generating electricity, we don't have battery technology at the point where you have storage. So you have to have something else that provides that base load or capacity. So wind and solar capacity, and it, certainly it's variable, but it's about 40%. Or less. And so you have to look at where else are you going to get a continual base load that will be able to provide energy and electricity if the sun's not shining and the wind isn't blowing. And so natural gas and nuclear are two of those things, hydrogen in the future and perhaps uh, fusion in the future as well. Those are energy sources that we have available now that can provide the capacity to be able to have a continual energy source. And the other thing that's happened with nuclear, so number one, we have this recognition, we have enough experience with wind and solar, they don't have the capacity. Um, and number two, uh, we have the um, what's happened in Europe with, uh, with Ukraine and the war in Ukraine. So what happened? They found out that relying upon Russia for oil and gas and natural gas put them at a disadvantage. So when Germany stopped, um, they wouldn't allow fracking, they didn't develop their own natural gas. They were primarily wind and solar and then importing natural gas from Russia. So they, they were in an energy crunch. Whereas France, who gets most of its electricity from nuclear, did not have the same national security and energy insecurity risk as did Germany. So I think that in general, uh, people have learned, and especially uh, those uh, on the left have learned that you need to have a continual base load. You need something other than wind and solar. And then the third thing would be innovation. So innovation, that great American innovation, entrepreneurial research has shown that smaller reactors, modular reactors, and some of this comes from the government as well yeah. uh, through DARPA, that small modular reactors, fourth and fifth generation reactors, much smaller, they can be put on an existing plant that may have already been retired, uh, that uh, those smaller reactors are much safer. And as we know, very few people have died from, you know, I don't know of anyone that died at Three Mile Island. Um, and so I think that there's this rebirth of nuclear, looking at it as a clean fuel, safer technology, and then getting over this hump where uh, getting acceptance through the public for nuclear. Yeah, such an important thing. We, uh, we've got a couple minutes left. I want to ask about what Congress is and can do to make this some more realistic. Obviously, permitting is a big problem. It took a Vogel in Texas like 10 years to get really up and running. Uh, what are some of the things that nuclear supply? we, we got to get more uranium. We, we outsourced a lot of Iranian to Russia during the Obama years. What are the most important things that Congress is going to try to do to make a cleaner nuclear energy future possible? So um, we just had a hearing on the Energy Subcommittee of Energy and Commerce on uh, nuclear uh, energy. And Jeff Duncan, Representative Jeff Duncan, who is the chair of that subcommittee, uh, is you know really forward thinking when it comes to nuclear. So he's going to continue to advance that. We're going to have bills in the very near future that we will be marking up and passing uh, legislation. One of the most important things that we already did uh, was to pass through HR 1 through uh, Congress, and that is an energy bill. So looking at permitting, um, as we know uh, that the regulatory environment has been so strict uh, and overburdensome when it came to nuclear, that it was very expensive to get a nuclear uh, plant uh, built and operational. So we finally have one that came online, uh, and we're looking to uh, develop that. And you, we can use the existing uh, nuclear uh, facilities that are already in place, that already have transmission lines, they've already been approved, and then put a small modular reactor. So how can we fast track places that have already been proven to be safe, and they already have infrastructure in place, I think is one of the things that we can utilize to bring nuclear on quicker. So the permitting process, uh, the advancement of nuclear bills that are, is going to come on, those things are going to be very important. On the permitting, we're waiting on the Senate for that. Uh, so hopefully we'll get the permitting uh, through on the Senate side and uh, come back to the House for negotiations. And we'll be able to start moving projects forward. Yeah, so important. we got about 30 seconds left. Tell us a little bit more about what your caucus does, because it's becoming so much more influential. And it's really changing the narrative in Washington that Republicans don't have a plan or care about carbon emissions. I think the most important thing we do is to engage. We're not afraid to enter into the conversation. We're not afraid to talk about what solutions we have, that innovation, pragmatism, you know, what our principles are, uh, and then also to counter some of the narrative on the left. 
you know, we want a, a carbon life cycle for energy production because it's not all the same. What may be uh, have no emissions on the generation side may have, when you look at the entire life cycle, carbon life cycle, may have tremendous effects on the environment. Uh, when you look at its inception to its disposal. So we want a level playing field. We want to be agnostic to energy source, meets energy demands, but also not refuse to engage in the conversation. We can have a cleaner, healthier planet. We can reduce emissions, and we can also have an abundance of affordable energy. Absolutely. A lot of heads in the audience nodding as I heard you say that. Congresswoman, always an honor to have you on the show. You're on the forefront of some of the most important work going on in Congress right now. Really grateful for your time today. So nice to be with you, John. Thank you so much for having me. You as well. Have a good night. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back with more conversations on the very exciting developments on nuclear power right after this. Sure.